Yeah, thank you guys for coming on today. Well, we, it's great to see your faces, everyone who's showing your video camera. Um, like Maria said, we have no excuses. So it's, it's really good to see you guys. Um, you know, just a quick, quick introduction. If I haven't met you guys yet, my name is Will Begno. I'm the new chapter president for our Georgia chapter of GBTA. Um, so excited to have you guys on the call today and excited to work with our amazing uh, board, board of directors that we have here. Um, a couple quick updates before we um, hand it over to Kim. Um, we've had uh, quite a few changes on the board uh, earlier this year. We've got some new folks in officer positions like Debbie, who's our new uh, vice president, uh, Isabella, who's our new treasurer. Um, and we, we've, we're excited about these changes. We've also added two new board members to our board. Um, so Maximo Echeverry, um, uh, who's not, he's not able to be on the call today, but also we have, um, we also have Amy Smith, um, who is uh, formerly, <laughs> Uh, formerly, formerly a different last name. Um, she is, she's been a part of the chapter for a long time, but now she's on a, now we're on a board and we're excited to have her membership. Um, so that's really exciting times. We also want to thank our, um, our cornerstone sponsor, um, Delta Airlines, uh, for being such a great partner to us over the years and continuing that, that awesome cornerstone partnership with us. So, uh, you know, thank you to Delta and uh, thanks guys for joining our call. With that, Kim, I'm going to hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Will, and um, I hope it's not too late to say Happy New Year to everyone. Since it's our first gathering, I'll go ahead and say it. So um, it gives me the great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today. And as many of you know, we had initially thought we would launch the year with our first in-person meeting, but um, Omicron had different ideas for us. So. Um, I really appreciate the fact that uh, Maria Chevalier, I reached out to her and she's known for her goal setting and her successes on, on setting goals and, and exceeding those goals. So she agreed to, um, to jump in for us today. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, I don't think Maria is a stranger to any of you, but just in case, just to remind you of some of her accomplishments. She's currently EVP of PredictX and last year, she was also elected to the executive board of GBTA as an allied at large member. So if any of you had an opportunity to see the Maria minutes on LinkedIn, she did a, um, a great job of campaigning. Um, she does come to us with over 30 years of experience in the travel industry, where she has executive experience within all aspects of the travel ecosystem. On the buyer side, she uh, managed some of the larger uh, travel programs, over a billion dollars in annual T&E spend with the likes of Johnson & Johnson and HP. And on the supplier side, um, she graced the doors of Hilton as executive director of, of business travel, um, supplier relations and consulting with BCD Travel and um, with Travelport as well. She's also won several industry awards, including the, um, the Business Travel News Group's Travel Manager of the Year. And she's always been ahead of her time in her adoption of data and analytic tools to improve travel programs and customer experience. Many of you may have seen um, or heard of her group on LinkedIn, CTME, for those that were um, that have, have been on a job search. Um, it actually started before the pandemic started, but it's been, it really gained a lot of momentum and Maria and the group at um, the volunteer group at CTME has been great on, on helping people find their next career opportunity. So today she'll share with us how to use data to set our own personal and professional goals for success. So with that, Maria, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Kim, really. Um, such kind words. I don't know that I'm deserving of the majority of those, so very kind. So um, look, you guys, the best presentations I say are one that you stop, you ask questions, you bring in different you know, opinions and thoughts. So, and as always, these are, this is your time, not mine. And so whatever you need to get the most out of it, please drive it directionally where you need. Um, and stop and interrupt with any questions or um, additional thoughts or comments. All right. So and Maria, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I'm glad you said that because I, I did want to let everyone know um, to Maria's point, this should be very interactive. You know, take a lot of notes. We will have the presentation on our website afterwards. And we are recording this for future playback. 
Um, but to Maria's point, she really is looking for interaction. So usually we ask you to put your comments or questions in the chat and we'll bring them up at the end. Um, we'll still have time at the end for questions, but feel free to jump in at any point. Let's make this informal and your meeting. Let's get out of it what we can. So thanks, Thank Maria. Yeah, okay. So the agenda really quick. Uh, I know everybody here knows how to read here, so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it's all about the goals. Um, are there, you know, why set them, how to establish them. Um, I also did a kind of a little comparison of kind of the overarching corporate type of goals and how they go about it versus those that are in sales and those that are on the buyer side. Um, I also am going to walk through a real life example while I was at Hilton to show you um, how to use data more effectively in this. And then I'm going to talk some about how do you establish the right goals? And I think that's some of the hardest things you'll go through. And then how do you plan for that? And then, yep, failure. Failure is a reality and, and how you overcome failure. So the first thing is, you know, what is a goal? You know, and I think the thing is, in looking at that, that the goal starts with a future or desired outcome. And it's achieved by a person or a group of people. And then I think what's important to look at it, it has to be something around a plan that you commit to. And then it's got to have some fences around it, some deadlines, some other things. And we're going to talk more about that. So I think I'm asked um, a lot, well, why do I have to set goals? You know, why is that so important um, in life? And Harvard Business Review in 2020 did a really good study on goal setting and its effectiveness of it, you know, on there. And let's face it, what else were they to do during COVID but do some additional studies, you know, on there. So but the interesting fact is it showed consistently that, that those with the goals were 10 times more successful than those without. 10 times. That's a pretty big number. The other interesting fact that came out of this study is that those that had them written were three times more successful than those that didn't. So the need for a plan, the written side, it adds to that. Now, don't you wish corporate America didn't have us put it in writing, but let's face it, they do um, on there. The other interesting thing that came out of the study is it also talked about the chemistry, the makeup of our brain. And there's actually this phenomenon called neuroplasticity, which talks about goal setting literally changes the structure of your brain. It actually does it so that it, op it optimizes it toward achieving the goal. So go figure, even your brain works with that. So on there. So what I'm gonna talk about throughout this is that all great roads in the case of goal setting are about data. It really is. And I know it's my favorite subject and I know I have an inherent bias built in. However, data is critical. One, to first the establishing of the goal itself and then to the ongoing management of the goals and then also identifying opportunities to meet and exceed the goals, finding alternatives when it's not working. <laughs> you know, out there and, and, and as an effective and efficient way to which to manage the goals. So we're going to talk more and more about how data plays into that and factors in. All right. So we've all seen different ways that you go about with goal setting, whether it's smart or explicit um, on there. I do always like the, the smart version of it to step back and say, OK, so often when you get goals, they're not specific enough. And if they're not specific enough, then you're destined to have miscommunication and then it, and areas. Now, this is always important too, because a lot of times these goals are dependent on our bonuses. So you need to make sure it's specific because your bonus depends on that it doesn't have vagueness, that it has the clarity that you need. Because at the end, you don't want it at the end when you're debating with your boss whether or not you got it because the interpretation and the vagueness leads to an ongoing discussion or debate at the end about your bonus versus at the beginning when it's much better suited. So you wanna make sure that it is specific enough. The other thing is to make sure that it is in fact measurable, it's quantifiable. It's tough when it's vague, when it's, when it, when it's not measurable because then it's up to subjectivity on there. And, 
part of your goals will always have an element of the lack of measurability when it comes to certain things, but wherever you can, you want to uh, apply that to that, that there's something that's quantifiable within the context of it. Um, also that it's attainable. And we're going to talk a lot about, it's very hard to find the balance of stretching people enough, but it's not so high that it's not attainable. Because we're going to talk more and more that if it's not attainable, people give up, you know, on there. Oh, Amy, see you raised your hand. Yes, I love this. I'm in sales. So very familiar with sales goals. My question is more so for the customer. How do you work with a customer when they don't even know their own goals? You know, it's interesting. I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, I'm in customer success now. And every January, I sit down with my customers and say, what are your goals this year? These are the discussions, Amy, I'm literally having with every customer. And not only that, I ask them what their company goals are. So I want to know how it threads in. What are your company goals and what are your goals? And on there, and I have to tell you, I have never had anybody come and say they didn't know their goals. That has, that's a first for me, Amy, um, on that one. Go ahead. You can jump in, Amy. You don't have to. No, that's, I mean, that's awesome. I love that. That's never happened to you. I think maybe in my world and for other suppliers, maybe you can step in, but the person that I'm working with day to day in travel wears many hats. So if they're in HR or if they're in finance or if they're in procurement, they may not have a specific travel goal. They might have a different goal based on other um, job titles and responsibilities. So maybe it was more specific to travel related, but. Is it a smaller uh, company? A smaller. I I work in a national space more than a global space. Okay. So. Yeah, so sometimes what happens is smaller business are, are, uh, haven't matured to the point that they have all of this formal structure around goals and all of these, you know, they, they kind of grow into certain processes and certain elements of it. But, you know, at that point, I think if I were in that situation, I would say, well, why don't we set a goal? Let's work together on what we're trying to achieve here to make sure that I'm, you know, exceeding meeting and exceeding what you need on it so let's figure out what you're trying what you're trying to achieve here even if it's not a formal goal i love that thank you you're very welcome great question and maria um a comment came in and i think this is a good suggestion is um ask you if 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 you do have that you have a client that's not really sure about what their their goals are ask them well how do you get a great review from your boss you know maybe maybe less about the KPIs, but may, maybe help them think about, you know, you know, good one. You, you can help, you know, co- you, you can become somewhat of a coach and help them set those well, goals. Yeah. And I think also to say, this is what my other customers are doing. You know, I always say that when you're in sales or, or customer success and support, your role is more of a consultant than anything. And so to coach them, to consult with them, how your other customers do it, to help them do it. Well, these are their goals this year. These are the things they're focusing on because it talks about, you know, goals are set based on what's going on in their company and what's going on in the market. Yeah, great conversation. Um, Okay, so attainable. Also that they're relevant and relevant is important that your goals align with kind of the company mission. The way I always say this is I'm a leg on the table. My my department supports is one supporting leg on a big old table for a company. So what is the company's mission to what we were talking about earlier? And what am I doing to help support that? And we're going to talk more and more about how that threads through and the importance that you want to know how it threads through because you want to know that your work is, it matters that it's contributing to something, you know, that the company is trying to achieve. An example of that is like when I was at HP, um, one of their growth strategies uh, was to expand into certain international markets. So then that became my goal. I had to support it from a travel perspective. 
um, the expansion into new um, global markets. So, and the other thing is it has to have time, you know, on there. And I always start with something simplistic, like, okay, my goal is to, um, you know, lose 10 pounds. Well, I should put some sort of time frame around that. I could say 10 years, but um, is to say, okay, I want to achieve that and I'm serious about that one. It's about the time I could achieve it, but is put something around it that is a time-based, okay? So let's talk about the corporate goals because in a lot of companies, it just cascades down. So you really, really want to pay attention to what's going on from the top because it's going to impact, you know, how the company is performing. I call it the roller coaster, you know, of how a company might be performing it has a lot to do with how your goals are going to be. If a company is thriving, your goals are going to be very different than if your company is struggling um, out there. The same thing with market. So you really want to pay close attention to what the company has established as their overarching goals. Because what's going to happen is senior management is going to cascade this to you, right? And depending on how many layers you are is how this will end up playing down. And then, of course, they're going to be developing their master plan about how they're going to meet and exceed it. And you want to make sure that you emulate what they're doing. Now, you also want to pay attention. Is a lot of their growth coming from top line growth? So is it coming from sales and what type of sales? So how does that impact you if you're on the sales side? Um, or is it all about controlling cost? So if you're on the travel procurement side, you want to watch what they're saying about cost containment driving um, the bottom line growth. Um, is it a focus on, you know, increasing profits because they're not beating market expectations on that, whatever the case may be, or is it about increasing market share or market share value? All of these are important to notice. The other things even is the thing, the way we're seeing now on corporate goals is everybody's coming out and establishing when they're going to um, establish their sustainability initiatives. And these presidents are going out meeting with their senior staff and said, we're going to be carbon neutral by this time, and then leaves it to everybody else to figure it out. But you want to watch those things because it says, okay, now what do I need to do either in my sales role or in my um, customer, in my um, travel department goal in order to support that CEO's goal and focus um, on there. And the other thing is don't hesitate to challenge a goal if you get it. Um, and I'm gonna talk a lot about this at what I did at Hilton to challenge a goal that I was given and, and how I got that changed. But I don't want you to fear that just because you get it doesn't mean you have to, you can challenge it. The other is just like um, the C-suite has done in order to establish this goal, we're gonna talk more and more about the importance that market intelligence plays I mean, they are researching every bit to establish what that is, especially if you're a public company and you're gonna be held accountable to it. You have to justify where that's coming from, how it's coming through, but it comes through market intelligence, a significant investment in data that allows you to look at it from the, the predictive side. And the other thing that I think when I look at where companies or in travel um, partners fail is they don't rely enough on their travel suppliers to help them in this journey of goal setting and the meeting of goals, All right? So let's talk about the travel buyer side. Depending on what department you report up to, um, to the question earlier, it could be very savings focused, especially if you're in procurement. And I know that because I reported up to procurement. Um, definitely there's priorities around savings. There's about customer engagement, um, risk mitigation, safety, security, sustainability, supplier diversity, um, you know, team management. Um, and we can just go on and on and on of, of the different categories that you can do that um, on there. So, when you look at this, and especially when you talk about savings, I think what, what a lot of travel managers learn that if they didn't know this, is the impact of that savings goal, which again, it tied to a bonus, what that has to do to impact when demand stops. Because if it's calculated based on a certain level of expenditure, then you're not gonna meet your savings goal because you're not spending as much. 
Now, you always want to monitor that anyway. So let's go to why is data important? Let's say that you have a goal. So at HP, I had a goal that every single year I had to drive 6% incremental, that's the word incremental, savings into the program every single year. And if you do the math, it is impossible because if you look at how often your airline contracts come up every three years, you know, on there and you go through the math and the science of it, because it has to be incremental. And if you were paying, you know, $200 for a room night, you have to take it down every single year um, and it becomes impossible to do. And after your contracts are best in class, your behaviors are best in class, where are you going to get it? Um, and the way I say it is when you're a mature program, you're going to get it from your data on there is so what you want to do is closely, closely develop a system that monitors things, not only to calculate the savings and the opportunity with the, that contract and supplier, but you have to very, very closely be monitoring buying behavior, the inflation deflation. When I was at EHP, we had an inflation that took literally uh, $30 million out of my budget in one year because of inflation. Um, demand, if demand shifts, um, it can seriously impact your ability to make your savings. And the interesting thing is when you go to senior management and say, well, demand is down, so I'm not going to make my savings number. But the good news is that's, you know, t and &E drop. They're going to say, I don't care. That's still your savings goal. So unless you have something built in to discuss that, to prepare that, to adapt um, on demand things, if not at the end, you could end up not making your goal because demand dropped. The other thing to look at is the currency impact because currency, absolutely, one year that cost me $12 million because of the fluctuation in currency, which negatively impact my savings calculations. And the other important thing to look at in your goals, when you look at things under savings and other things are travel pattern changes and travel pattern changes now more than ever as people are leaving these big, you know, uh, New York cities and L.A.'s to come to the beautiful city of Atlanta and others um, travel pattern changes, even though they always existed, they are shifting now more than ever before because people are, in fact, living where they want to live instead of where they had to live in order to um, be able to do their jobs. So corporate America has learned that that's not the case. So you have to closely monitor because if you have a shift, let's say that your number one city pair is New York City and it shifts to Atlanta, Georgia, well, that's a big drop in everything. All of your, your average costs will drop which is good, but then more people are traveling here. So it can totally throw off your savings calculations. So you want to be able to monitor back using good data to say why your savings numbers are working or not working. Also, this will give you plenty of data to help you understand where there's opportunity as well. Okay, any questions before I shift to the sales side? All right, so you're a supplier. And so what I want you to notice, and I know you guys get this, you're going to say, duh, Maria, we know this, we live it every day, is sometimes when you're a supplier and you're buyer, you have opposite goals. You know, one is trying to get costs down, one's trying to get your sales up, you know. So, um, you know, with supplier, it's often about revenue and customer retention and satisfaction and, um, you know, the adoption of new products and services, you know, on there. It, same thing with team performance, but they're all about finding new customers, building um, business with existing customers, either with the exist the products that you have today or the expansion of new products. And, and the goal is always to get better margins, um, move market share and get better margins. So in the case on the supplier side, when you're talking about goals, it's very important too is to work closely with your customer to find out what their goals are to the point earlier from Amy and to be able to put this into your goals as you're moving forward in the plan. Because if you know, like in the case of the HP, I was there to expand into new international markets because HP is, then that's something that you can build into your plan in order to grow the business. 
Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about um, a typical way a lot of companies handle goals. They do the peanut butter spread. I feel like Oprah, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, except for you get 6%, you get 6%, you get 6%. Everybody gets the same number and it doesn't work. But so often they do that. So regardless of, you know, you know which department this is and this, they peanut butter spread it in sales. They do it in procurement. Okay, you know, we've got to save X percent. So everybody has to come up with it. We've all been in that meeting you know, find the money, show me the money on both sides of it. So what happens? Well, I'm going to walk you through um, where at Hilton, um, when I came into Hilton, they were doing this whole peanut butter spread. And as a result, 75% of the team was not making their goal. And it very low morale, people were giving up because nothing was achievable um, on there. So we're going to walk through why peanut butter spreading doesn't work. So what did I, so the first thing I did was I said, look, we have to add science and data to our goal setting approach. So what I did was, first of all, I took three years of customer data to look at the trending out there. We also, we did very specific demographics on performance modeling. We also took not only um, Hilton, but we also took that customer where we could find what their growth plans were and that industry forecasting. So let's take, for example, during that time, the oil and gas industry was, was challenged. So we segmented out, we said we shouldn't put that same 6% um, new revenue growth on any of the you know, sales reps that were supporting the oil and gas industry. It's not achievable. They're shrinking, they're not growing. Now we can certainly do everything we can to increase market share, but that whole entire business had shrunk significantly. So we looked at how industry forecasting, what industries were growing and thriving, what were the top companies within that. We also went through um, where it was public and available to look for what their projections were, incorporated that data point in there. We then also look across the board, took um, third party data that talked about what were the demand projections and we added that in and used it to apply it market by market. Um, we weighted the ADR projections um, and, and the market, we didn't put it across the board um, and we took some inflation deflation data to add to it. So we built this very sophisticated model to establish goals, much more instead of peanut butter spreading it. The other thing I think that was important and different was we involved every single team member. They were allowed to review the goal, to build a business case, to object to the goal on there. Um, and we, they participated in getting information like the company's growth and other data points. So they became involved in it. So when you get somebody involved in it, you're going to have much, much better results than if you just hand it to them and say, here it is, here's your goal, you know, that's it. So that made an important differentiation. So what happened? Well, 95% of the team achieved or exceeded their goals. Then the department succeeded because at this point, even though we had that same 6% number and 5% number that the previous years had, we blew the department goal out of the water on there. Morale increased, turnover was reduced. The team received the highest payout in its history and the highest revenue increase in five years. And we were seeing then at that point as one of the top generated departments because we stopped and we used good data good business intelligence to our goal setting. So it worked all the way around, all the way around. As a matter of fact, which you guys were smart, they did not budget for my team to get that kind of a bonus. So that made that discussion really fun, but I was able to say, but you've gotten all this other revenue to offset it. But in the hotels, the challenge is it's a franchise environment. So that money doesn't go directly in, but don't worry paid and life was good and the Disney movie continued. So it's very, very, very important 
that you get as much data and science as you can out of it in order to use that to effectively goal set. The Maria? Other, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, before you move on, um, I have a question for you. So that sound, what you, what, what you and Hilton did was phenomenal. How long of a process was that? That it sounds there were, there was a lot that went into it. So for, for the sake of everyone here, what, what some advice or how do, how do you do that? And, and what kind of time frame did you look at to do that? A great question, Kim. It was a year. It was a year in the making, as you can imagine. Um, you had to get the company to agree that this was a priority. You had to get the right resources allocated to that, uh, the investment of people and also the investment in data sources and then an investment into a system to do it. Um, so, but um, luckily we got the support of Hilton to do it. And then of course, once they saw the result, then they continued to emulate that throughout because they saw the benefit of doing this across all board. So, but it's a good year in the making. And um, so great question. Thank you, that's good. The other thing is it's always a balancing act. Too high, too low, <laughs> you know? How do you know what is the right goal to set? And it's interesting, there's, a, a, there's over a thousand studies that consistently have shown that setting high and specific goals is, is, is linked to increased performance and motivation. Um, but there's always that balance and it's not an easy one at all, you guys, it's not. Because uh, you want it high enough that people stretch but not so high that they give up, you know, on there. So when I looked at goal setting, so even with all the science we had, and we said, wow, I looked and said, this person typically gets this percent. So let's say that they typically got about 4% uh, growth out of their customer. And science told me they should be at 10. Do I think they can go from four to 10? Probably not. Um, so what we did, we staged that out and said, let's make it right between the two. Let's take it up to seven. And then the next year, make it 10. So because studies show time and time again, if you make the goal too high, people will just throw up their hands and say, I can't achieve it. So I'm not even going to try. I just, they absolutely give up. And it's then it's also very, very, very demotivating, you know, on their uh, morale, you know, just plummets and it becomes such a, a horrible situation to be in. There's nothing worse than knowing that you can't achieve a goal. And it's also, remember, it impacts people financially. These are, these are threaded back to, to raises and bonuses on there. And the same thing happens if it's too low. If it's too low, studies show same thing, that people are just like, okay, I'll get that done in the first three months of the year and then I'm just gonna snooze it out. And you don't want that either. And especially, when you have a, uh, an organization, a fairly large organization, you have to make sure because there's nothing worse than when you have that too low with certain people in your organization, then the other people catch on to that and say, well, why am I killing myself um, out there? So you need to balance that out with too high, too low, with right the, the right number. So the other thing is, okay, you got our goal. We talked about all things on the goal. Well, you have to have a plan. If you don't have a plan put together on how you're going to achieve it, then you're not. So just because I said I'm going to lose 10 pounds, well, how am I going to do it? Am I going to exercise more? Am I going to finally start eating right um, on there and give up all my trips to Chick-fil-A several times a week? Okay, with the fries, I, I get it. But, you know, how am I going to do that? So you've got to start putting together a plan around it. And so your plans have to mirror that whole smart thing. And then in addition to that, not only do you have to put together a plan, but you have to, on a regular basis, keep management up to date. And I recommend at least monthly. I am a fan of written presentations because then it's all written um, on there um, that you're keeping keep the idea of what you've already completed to meet that goal, what's upcoming, how far you as, you know, as the percent of goal what are the risks that you see coming out? 
what are any failures that you've um, experienced and what are some of the lessons learned from those failures? And then if the plan's going awry, what are any adjustments to the plans, okay? Um, and studies show again, there was a great study by the American um, Psychological Association and just talked about the more frequently you check in the progress of the goal, the more likely you are to meet and exceed them. So these check-ins are not only for you, but they're also to keep management involved, engaged, and also um, management is there to help you overcome those challenges, overcome the issues that you face in trying to meet and exceed these, um, help you overcome those barriers, but they have to be specific. You've got to say, these are the actions that I'm going to take in order to meet that goal. So if your goal is to reduce your cost by 6%, then what I always do is break it down. Well, how much can I get through my contracts? How much can I get through behavioral? How much can I get through these different you know, initiatives that I have? How, where is each one of it gonna come from? And then what am I gonna do to achieve that? And in what time frame? So some of it can come through a policy change, for example. So why, why do goals fail? So I think, um, first of all, if they're not specific enough, if people have doubts in them, they don't believe in them to start with. And that's one thing I wanna stress is when you give somebody a goal, you've gotta get their buy-in too. And you're thinking, well, they work for me, they should just accept it. Well, that's not the reality of human nature, all right? Um, also, if the goals aren't motivating, if and when I found sometimes in procurement, if all my job was to beat up suppliers, that wasn't motivating to me. You know, I needed more than that. I needed the innovation. I needed the um, other things. I need to know that what I was doing was having an impact somewhere, like on the sustainability or my passion around, you know, supplier diversity and diversity in general. I need have those tied into it, not just, let me just be a, you know, the supplier, whip the supplier, you know, type thing. It needed to be more than that, to motivate me, to feed my soul. So I think those are important, that that threads through and that you're not involved. If you're, if, if you're just handed a goal and your voice doesn't matter, your opinion doesn't matter, then um, if you're not as involved, it will fail. So the example, one example too, when I was at Hilton, was when they came to me with a 6% goal, I went through and presented back to senior management because it was as um, we were hitting a slight uh, decline in the marketplace. And I showed them projections going on for the next two years where it showed that ADR was dropping, demand was dropping, this was dropping and all of this. And that um, a market share, even with a market share shift in this and this, it just wasn't an achievable number. I was able to get that number dropped by two points because I went in with sound data to, in a business case, to argue the position on it. So, you know, I got involved. I got involved and I participated. The other is other things like not focus, um, the excuses, um, you know, on there. We all get distracted. I think that's a tough one because our day-to-day, -day, how many get at the end of the week and realize they've done nothing toward the goals? Uh, you've just been in back to back to back to back meetings um, and nothing. So my advice to you is set 30 minutes of a reoccurring meeting on your calendar every week that says goals, that you stop for a minute and you just take a peek and say, what, what can I make sure that is still moving along outside of the standard meetings with staff and everything else just for yourself on there? The other is people give up too soon. They just think that it's just not achievable. So they give up without trying to battle it, without trying to solution it, without trying to, to get in there and, and you know, get to a whiteboard and say, guys, I, I realize that you know, we're about to hit the iceberg and things are looking kind of bleak right now, but let's all brainstorm and see what new ideas we can come up with of ways that we can achieve this that we've never tried before. So um, I like Michael Jordan's quote here, if you run into a wall, don't, don't turn around and give up, figure out a way to climb it, go through it or walk around it. The other thing you know, I wanna um, you know, kind of close with is 
um, some of my greatest successes have been my biggest failures out there is you learn so much um, through any sort of failure and it's part of success. It is. So don't fear it. Um, don't avoid it. Um, don't avoid it yourself or with your boss or anything else is identify it as early as you can notify as soon as possible. Make sure that you've got really command of the key elements that are driving it and why it's occurred. And that goes back to your data. Um, go in there with good, accurate, sound data. Um, a plan to either overcome it or your plan B around it, because that's what our job is. is if this isn't working, what else do we have in our bag of, of you know, things that we can pull out and say, you know what? Um, I wasn't planning on doing this for two years, but I'm going to move this forward because the original plan's not working. Try and solution it out. And I always say, you know, even as a manager, when somebody comes in my desk to, to let me know of a failure, I think the only failure really is when they don't come with ideas to try and solution it out. And it doesn't be the holy grail of ideas. It just shows me that you're thinking about it, that you're not just, as I call it, lobbing it over. Here, Maria, it's not working, so now it's your problem because I told you about it. That's not how it works. I want you to be part of discussing, solutioning out what could be a plan B um, on there. So, and that's important. And I will close it. Um, dream written down with a date and details becomes a goal. Um, Goals written down in steps become a plan. A plan backed by action makes dreams and goals a reality. So, and that's it. So any qu additional questions or comments? That was wonderful, Maria, thank you. That was any really feedback? great. I think, yeah, I've got some feedback. So I, I love what you said about, um, you know, writing, you know, people with goals are 10 times more successful and then writing them down makes you three times more. Um, we, I think we all kind of know that subconsciously. If we write something, we're going to learn it better, right? But it's, it's kind of cool to see the, the, the studies show that it creates a physiological response in your body. That's kind of neat. Um, but I love that 30-minute time block for the goals. So I wrote that down for myself personally because that's something that I, I could see working when a busy work week just kind of snowballs and takes your eye off the prize, so to speak. So thank you for that. Yeah, thanks. I'm a huge proponent of that. And I always say to write down on your calendar uh, a reoccurring meeting about your own career. What are you doing every week for your career? What's the goal for your career? Do you want to advance in your career? So then what are you doing to do that? So every week I say, what am I doing to either read an article that I need to uh, improve my skills or meet with another executive or do what? What am I doing for my own personal goal to advance my career? That's a fabulous one. Um, uh, everything you've said is great. Uh, I, sometimes I think we get so busy doing in the moment that we we don't take the time to sit down and really assess what we're doing, you know, to 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 advance professionally or per, per, personally. So that's that's great. And if you think about millennials, millennials enter their job and they already are thinking about their next one. They do, you know, um, on there. So I, you know, I take, you know, just as far as your career goes, so often I see that with people, they don't set those goals for their own career. And so all of a sudden a year goes by and you're like, okay, um, what am I doing? You know, mm -hmm. on there is what have I done to advance my career? Who else have I met that have, can help me with that? What skills do I need to go to that next job and getting those skills? What are you doing? Um, and if you don't put it on your calendar and take time for your own personal professional goals, it's the same thing. That's a good point. And we hope everyone here will include GBTA as part of your own growth. So on the local level and on the, uh, the global chapter. Uh, Maria, we did have another question that came in. Um, the first part of it is a comment, great presentation. Do you segment out short-term and long-term goals? 
Yeah, it's part of the timeline of it. So absolutely, you always want to have your eye on the longer term goals and how you get there, you know, versus just a lot of times some, and I call them bad, you know, less effective executives are very focused on low hanging fruit all the time. It's the short wins. And um, if, and you can always tell, I always look at the executives, if they're, they don't have five year plans out there, there's, it's a huge mistake because you really have to be concentrating on where you get long term and just not short term. So both are very critical to the evolution of where you need to take that. So one example is when you take over a new role, you know, whether it's in a new company or otherwise, uh, studies show it takes you 18 months before you make that organization yours it's because you inherit the staff. You haven't chosen those people. OK, so you're going to start with what's your strategy and then the strategy is supported by the structure that will help you meet that. And what are the people that you need in there to do that? So you're going to have to deal with performance issues and the restructuring issues and all of those. That's a longer tail solution sometimes. Sometimes that takes 24 months. But you have to have your eye on that. Where do you start first? What are the biggest priorities that, again, thread back into that overarching strategy that you're putting in place for that organization that you've gotten approval from. So um, the long-term and short-term ones are both critical that you keep an eye on. Great. The other thing too I'll add to this is in your plans, make sure you keep yourself agile. And the reason I say that because on a dime, if we didn't learn anything else from COVID, overnight things can shift, okay? So keep your programs agile. So adjust to changes in your company, because you guys know this, you get one new executive in there and everything you do changes. Every priority, everything you're doing changes overnight um, on there. I used to laugh when I was at HP, there were three different CEOs and I had five different bosses in three years. And every new CEO changed the uh, standard template PowerPoint that came in. So all of our decks had to be readjusted and refitted. And I'm telling you, it was like a month's worth of work every time they came in. Oh, it's a black background. Now it's a white background. Now it's a this color font, you know, um, on there. But they change all your priorities too. So remain nimble and adjust accordingly because the best thing that you could do in staying nimble, those are the best um, leaders that you want in your organization because they can adjust and pivot where you need to pivot because you're going to have to. Um, yeah. It is never at, you know, in stone. Don't ever think that and just get ready to pivot where you need to pivot. Great advice. Um, another question that came in. Uh, what if you aren't necessarily wanting to advance your career per se, but remain relevant and valued in the later part of one's career? Oh, that's a great question. God, you guys are good. I'm trying to sweat. Okay. So that's a great one because when I say advance, it doesn't have to be upward mobile. Advancing could be anything. It could be vertical. It could be just, you know, again, keeping yourself relevant and keeping yourself relevant is equally as important is keep yourself. I always say, learn something new every day. You know, I had a mentor really early on and she taught me the importance of reading and reading to learn. And that's a form, whether it's reading the Wall Street Journal, reading the trade publications, reading about getting, expanding your skills, you know, or taking a course to expand your skills. Um, I'm a big, big proponent of mentors, you know, um, to that have one of the greatest keys to my success have been mentors um, on there is that advancing is any direction you want to go. But in order to remain relevant to remain uh, you know invaluable is to seek it in that expertise become a real expert where there's a need in the market so like right now i would tell anybody become an expert in sustainability i'm telling you right now that every company is coming out with sustainability goals and all these things around it it is and that it is complex the more complex it is, the more you can become an expert, it's going to help you. 
anytime you are an expert, a real expert, that there's a need in the marketplace, you will forever be employed on there. The other one I would tell you is diversity. Be an expert in diversity. Supplier diversity is very complex in the travel category. You know, let's face it, our number one spend is airlines and they're not diverse. So, you know, show me the money. So, and it's very important. So look at the market, look at what the trends are. What are the top, um, you know, articles that are read, you know, at BTN and follow that um, on there. We talk about this, Kim mentioned the, um, career search group that, you know, I formed and I formed it to help people that were in transition, um, whether they had been displaced or they choose to leave. And this comes up all the time. I don't want my next role to be this way. I just want to, you know, expand it in an area it comes up all the time in our calls and in our um, conversations. So look at making yourself invisible to where the need is, watch the trends you know, on there, because it, it, it can show you exactly how to have an amazing career by being an expert. The other is data. Data is the other one. Data so. is king. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's it, unless anyone else has another question or comment. Um, going mm -hmm. once, twice. Well, so, thank you, Maria. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, any questions on the career search group? We have actually a few minutes. Anybody? Because sometimes if you want a question or a comment, just in general on career search. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. We should put that link out. Um, I can put it in here. What it, it's, it's on LinkedIn. Yeah, so it's, look, the one thing that you're going to know about me is I'm not very creative. So the naming of the group sucks. And if anybody wants to come up with a better one, I'm always open to it. So we had to put something together really quick on LinkedIn. So CTME stands for Corporate Travel Meetings and Events Search Party, because it's my sense of humor coming through <coughs> on there. And so we have a, a private group on LinkedIn that you can join. And we have a call every Tuesday at four of anybody who's looking and it is confidential. Um, there's two rules to it, confidentiality and pay it forward. Uh, we don't charge anything. It's just a group of people trying to help. So um, it is completely um, a group that we help you from end to end from deciding what you want to do and then developing a plan and goals to get there. Um, so yeah, we're a group to help. So any anytime, if you know anybody who has been displaced or anyone who needs help, don't hesitate to connect them to our group. We're there to help. And certainly during COVID, you know, uh, the numbers increased tremendously, but um, we've been doing this over 10 years and the company Dime has done articles on us as of others, um, because we're just a group trying to help. Great, great. Thank you. So once again, I put that in there. It's um, CTME, Corporate Travel Meetings and Events Search Party, and it's to help you um, advance and possibly find your next uh, career or next position suited for you. So with that, Maria, thank you oh, very you're much. Welcome. I'm honored to be here. And do reach out personally if you have any questions that you think of later, you know, on there. Um, Kim will tell you I'm always accessible. Um, yep. But um, you know, happy goal setting and goal meeting. And thank you guys so much. You know, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. And if um, if we have a few more um, business items to go through, so if everyone will hold on for just a few more meetings, okay. I'm going to uh, pass the baton over to Rick George, who's going to talk a little bit about sponsorships. So Rick, you're up. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Kim, and a great job, Maria, as, as always. Uh, nice, nice to see you again, for sure. Um, wanted to send a big shout out to everyone on this call. Uh, you have done a great job. We have uh, increased our sponsorships by about 500% in the last three weeks, which uh, is absolutely awesome. And want to pay tribute uh, to a few of the new folks that uh, are sponsors for the year. First of all, BCD. Um, has agreed to be our education sponsor, longstanding 
uh, relationship there. So uh, BCD, Kathy Bedell, not sure if you're on this call, but uh, really appreciate that. And, and Kim, uh, well, you're working to make that happen. Uh, MXGBT, haven't seen MXGBT for quite a while at, at uh, our, our Georgia chapter, and uh, they are a platinum sponsor uh, this uh, coming year, as is Travel Inc. Great to see them back. And UPS, um, hoping, hoping, fingers crossed, that we might be able to have an in-person meeting at uh, the UPS facility at some point this year. Uh, this year. That would be great. Uh, also, two new gold sponsors, Circo, uh, thank you, thank you, and the Southern Company uh, has uh, come on as uh, gold sponsors. So Circo and Southern new sponsors for gold. We are still on the hunt, folks, for uh, platinum uh, meeting sponsors. We did not, unfortunately, have a uh, platinum sponsor for this meeting, but it is my goal that we will have one for our very next one. So please, please um, let me know. And um, we'd, uh, we'd love to uh, get things worked out with you. So uh, good to see all of you. Uh, Happy New Year uh, with, with the new year. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Debbie. Thanks, Rick. Um, great job, Maria. Uh, great intro to the next topic. Um, this year, I'm uh, in the position of vice president on the board and thrilled with the board members that I'm working with, the new members and, and the existing team. Um, and as vice president, my big goal for 2022 is the auction. And I'm following in some uh, in, in uh, Will's footsteps. Will did a phenomenal job with the help of Isabella, the entire board last year and all of the donors and bidders in 2021, we came just shy of our goal of $20,000. And in a year that was embattled with COVID and a lot of you know, uh, challenging budgets, uh, we were still able to come real close. We came in just under $20,000 in 2021 with the auction. In 2022, we have uh, raised the goal and as Maria said, if it's not if it's written down, it's ten times more effective. So I have written it down. Looks backwards to me here, but our <laughs> here it is. So the twenty twenty two goal is twenty five thousand dollars for our auction, and um, we are going to monitor monitor that goal monthly. Uh, one of the goals to achieve that number is to have a committee formed. I'm asking of the membership. Uh, a minimum of two people to uh, step forward and, and assist on the auction committee. And we're going to start early on in getting commitments for 2022, starting with those folks that, that donated in 2021. So uh, it's going to be a, a good year. Uh, this year is going to turn around. I know it for our industry. It already is with sponsorships. Good job, Rick. Uh, and I'm very excited uh, to work with all of you in the coming year. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Kim or Will. Thank you, Debbie. No, that, that's awesome. And you know what, that, that's a great goal. And I love that you, uh, you actually typed that out and wrote that down because uh, you're going to make it 10 times more likely to succeed, right? Absolutely. Uh, three I'll times have it more. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, um, I want to hand it over to Heather for just a minute just to talk a little bit about community service. Um, you know, Heather, just by the way, is our new community service chair for this year is no, no stranger to uh, leading community service um, efforts across multiple organizations. And so we, she's an awesome fit for that on our board, but I'm gonna turn it over to her for just a few minutes. Thanks, so, um, Thanks, Will. So, oh, am I? Yeah, I'm on. Um, so a couple things. I know we, you know, we used to do a ton of community service with, uh, you know, Georgia BTA, and we kind of took a little bit of a, a hot minute um, with COVID. We, we weren't able to do some of the stuff with the children and things like that. So this year, our goal is to gonna, gonna have three different community service events. Um, and one of those will probably be, you know, during the, the Christmas months and winter months of coats and toys for kiddos. And then um, ideally, depending on how the summer is, with COVID and what we can and can't do, doing something with some of our old partners. And then I know Delta is also inquired about um, us helping them with a community service event. So I just, we obviously are going to be posting online, but if you guys have other suggestions, I know um, we had talked about the foster care center and, and they can always use lots of hands to, to help with, you know, folding and packing and things like that for the, the tons of foster care kids. But if there is a organization that you're super passionate about, by all means, uh, reach out because we would love to, to investigate what we can do. And um, I know there's
there's a lot of people on this call that have a huge passion to give. So um, I'm going to help coordinate that, but just keep a link uh, or keep your eyes on both LinkedIn and Facebook um, because you're going to see that content there. So thank you guys in advance for your, your generous hearts. Awesome. Thanks for the update, Heather. Um, we're excited, obviously, to have as much involvement as we can with our membership uh, with Community Service Outreach this year. Now that we're kind of going back to in person, and uh, that's coming up in the next couple of months, by the way, guys, um, we're excited to get out in the community with y'all and actually get some hands on and, and make an impact in our community um, in a more in a more physical way as possible this year. So um, that's a good opportunity for us. Um, just you know, one, before we go, just a couple of closing closing things um, in the meeting today, and we want to thank thanks Maria again for uh, such an awesome. Um, educational session and, and the content that you gave us today. So thank you to Maria for that. Um, we also, again, want to thank Delta as our corner, cornerstone sponsor, um, you know, making it possible for our chapter and for the organization this year. Um, and then also just want to remind you guys, there's a post-meeting survey and we actually, we actually do read all of those and take that into heart and um, take your feedback um, to try to make this better um, on the next virtual and in-person meeting we have. So uh, just fill that out for us if you don't mind. Um, speaking of next meetings, right now, February is going to be virtual for us again, and our speakers to be determined. So stay tuned in the next week or so to get an update on that. Um, and then we're gearing up for our first in-person meeting on March 8th in Sandy Springs. That is, our, that is our date we're pretty sure on. That could change a day or two off, but that's what we're planning on for now, our first in-person meeting uh, with an exciting uh, panel of buyers. Um, moderated by our very own Heather Patrick. So we're excited to see how that, you know, that meeting turns out and to see you guys all there in person. Um, before we go, one last reminder, please jump on social media and follow us if you don't already. Um, Georgia, it's a Georgia BTA um, is, is how it's set up or GBTA Georgia chapter on LinkedIn and Facebook. And uh, guys, we really appreciate your time today. Thanks for coming. And, and with that, uh, we should give everyone back quite a bit of time today in your schedule. And again, thanks for spending your time with us. We look forward to seeing you on the next meeting.